very queenly pick. <laughs> it's like, yes, well done. It is. Hi, we're live. Yay! Okay. Hello. Okay. Welcome to our How to Catch a Queen release celebration with Alyssa Cole and then Kit Rocha with, um, sorry, Kit Rocha, I apologize, um, and Brie and Donna. Hey, queenly pick. Hi. Like, yes. Oh, then. no, I've got the stream open somewhere. Right. Hi, Brie. Brie. Or no, someone does. I don't think it's me, actually. Okay. I don't think it's me. Oh, okay. okay, it's gone. It's fine. Yay! So how are y'all doing? <laughs> Hi. Okay, so this is, first, I would like you, each of you to introduce your crowns. <laughs> because I'm assuming they have names because they're really cool looking. Um, and it's called um, Etsy Paper Crown. And <laughs> <laughs> this is my fairy princess crown that I got to go with my green Halloween wig, but I'm wearing it with my purple today because it's still my fairy princess crown. <laughs> Excellent. Um, mine is my... Um, undefined medieval queen crown that turned out to be too heavy to actually affix to anything so I had to sew it onto this wig so Amazing. aren't you glad I didn't say onto my head um <laughs> I had to sew it onto this wig so this is actually this is my my super voluminous Halloween wig this is my I've been calling it my my Sansa Stark wig um so, you know, I guess it's like, you know, the crown for the Queen of the North. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Sorry, if you did not get spoiled by years of tweets, then... Look, I've never even seen this show, so why am I handing out spoiler alerts? <laughs> I don't know. I watched two, I mean, I read the first three books. I watched two episodes, I think, and then I would just watch it on Twitter. And it yeah. Was I'm, ima I'm imagining that watching it on Twitter was actually quite amazing because we had some strong reactions in those last few seasons. <laughs> Twitter and fanfic. I have determined that Twitter and fanfic were a better way to uh, to consume that show than to actually watch it with your eyeballs. <laughs> yeah. I was like, maybe I'll go back and watch it one day then. Well, spoiler, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> additional spoiler. It sucked. Um, it all ended in tears. So for all of us. <laughs> except for the people watching on Twitter who were like, ha ha ha. I did not invest. No, I'm kidding. I did not laugh at anyone's <laughs> pain over the ending. I didn't um, either, but okay. I you could have laughed sure a bit. <laughs> I sure was glad I didn't invest like eight I, years yeah. of my life into it. I, I know that pain, so I mostly was just glad that I wasn't feeling it again myself. Yes. Right. Um, but we are actually here. Yeah, this is just going to be a Game of Thrones um, discussion for people who have not watched it. <laughs> that would be so hilarious. <laughs> not why we're here, but so hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there was a dragon the dragons lived happily ever after the end um okay but we are actually here it is rounding out how to catch a queen release week I'm here. <laughs> yes and, um i'm here with brie and donna um all three of us are, i was gonna say they make up kit rusha but actually all three of us do along with courtney as yes. everyone learned this week. We're like 64 so <laughs> kid. Um, if you didn't see on Twitter, someone identified Courtney Milan as part of Kit Rosha, and then we began discussing how we are all part of Kit Rosha. Yes. Um, but in reality, Kit Rosha, Brie and Donna are here, and they'll also be talking about their book, Deal with the Devil their mercenary librarian's book that came out this past July. Yes, I yes. can't believe you remember that because I was like, oh God, when did it come out? Oh, I was going to say August, so it was July. Thing you were, <laughs> um, oops. It feels many, like many years ago. Yeah, <laughs> an eternity. Yeah, it was all 84 years ago, so. 
Um, but we're here. We are also part of Romancing the Runoff, which was an initiative started by Brian Courtney to raise money for um, Georgia, the George, upcoming Georgia runoffs. And um, this was planned before that happened in Pretty Shores, but like now the past few weeks have just been us doing stuff together all the time, which is fine. Yeah. It's amazing. And we're also tonight, uh, we, the uh, run, Romancing the Runoff raised $460,000 mm -hmm. and counting of what feels like monopoly money, but is real <laughs> live money. So much money, so much. <laughs> going to grassroots organizations in Georgia, going to Project New Georgia, um, Black Votes Matter and Fair Fight started by Stacey Abrams, the inspiration for Romancing the Runoff, uh, romance author and amazing politician, Stacey Abrams. And now so, our best friend. Yes. <laughs> and she has acknowledged us and donated a book to our auction. So we are all yeah. best friends now. <laughs> yeah, best now. Um, yeah. And tonight we'll be playing Among Us um, with some people who were kind enough to bid in the auction to play Among Us with us. Um, I have only played twice in my life and I was the imposter and imposter both times. So oh, no. I, have, I have no idea how to do the wiring. I have no idea how to stop the reactor from going. I just know how to kill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see what happens when <laughs> in tonight. Sounds so <laughs> terrifying, but also amazing. Awesome. <laughs> but the funniest part was um that I actually kept getting confused because I have, I, it is hard for me to retain maps in my brain. So mm -hmm. I would look at where I was on the map and then like go kill someone and then vent somewhere and then look at where I was on the map and be confused. Then someone else would kill someone and I would be standing there and I'd be like, why did you, why are you standing here? <laughs> I'm like, I have, I've looked at the map 10 times in 30 seconds and still don't know where I am. Um, but also I killed someone to get <laughs> Ignorance is a really good cover though. Like you can honestly say completely like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't know where I am. And that, you know, that works pretty well. I found. <laughs> yes. Yes. Infamously, Christina, who was one of our volunteers on Romancing the Runoff, the first night she played, she kept reporting her own kills by mistake, but she did it so many times that even Donna was finally like, this is so suspicious. She cannot be doing this. Yeah, I mean, it happened like four times and I was like, no one would, would be diabolical enough to do this on purpose. So, and I mean, nobody would be incompetent enough to do it like by accident this many times. So it must just be, you know... She must be finding all of these dead bodies. Like, no, no, <laughs> not what was happening. Um, so leading, I guess, from kills to uh, our books, <laughs> or your book in particular, can you talk a little bit about Mercenary Librarians and Deal with the Devil for anyone who does not, has not read it yet? Do you want to go, Donna? No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this is what I get for asking. Okay, Mercenary yeah. Librarians is our series about, um, ironically, a group of book lovers <laughs> who join together in community organizing to fight tyranny in Georgia. So not at all related to what we did for the last three weeks, except for <laughs> exactly what we did for the last three weeks. So our book is basically fanfic that we wrote before Romancing the Runoff. <laughs> Perfect. Or romancing Who's the one off is mercenary librarians fanfic. I'm not really sure. Yeah. About those. <laughs> Maybe. Um, and the heroine is like, uh, we pitched it as a post-apocalyptic Wonder Woman meets dystopian Captain America. So it's super soldiers oh, and like women hot. with superpowers. And are they enemies? Maybe are they lovers? Eventually, are they friends? Hopefully. <laughs> Is there betrayal? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, lots of fun stuff. Yes. Um, 
and How to Catch a Queen, which came out, also has book lovers uh, fomenting rebellion. <laughs> and the, not quite in the same way. There are no superpowers. Well, the, the superpower of community, I guess. Yeah. Um, and it Also takes, mysterious like, reveals. Mysterious reveals. And uh, it's basically like a Lair takes a wife historical romance um, because I really love Julie Garwood and, you know, those old school, those, that, that particular kind of old school romance, not all old school romances. Um, and so I kind of took that trope, but I set it in um, a Highland country and kingdom in Africa. And uh, the king is brooding and scary. The new king is brooding and scary, but that's because he has anxiety and he is just yeah. trying to, to get through the day. Um, so it's a matter I of really, really relate to that, honestly. Like, not to interrupt you, but I just yeah. want to say how much I relate to that because there are a lot of people who think that I'm extremely scary and like aloof and stuff, but really I'm like, I have actually, like, people have spoken to me, and I have actually just, like, stared at them. Like, not because I didn't want them talking to me, but because I was, like, I got caught in this loop of, like, how do I respond? And so I just wound up not, and so I would just stare at them. And it was like, oh, oh, my God, she's terrifying. But really, I was just, like, in my head was, like, constant. Yeah. So I relate. Yes, uh, Sonia has been raised in a kingdom where uh, strength is the priority. And there are, you know, reasons for this. It's a former colony of Lichtenburg, which is uh, the kingdom in a prince on paper, which Johan was trying to, you know, rekindle connections and kind of make amends in his, you know, playboy Jojo secret charity dude way. And um, in this we see, and when we first meet him, he is like all in prints on paper, he seems really scary. Uh, but we learn in How to Catch a Queen that he is actually scared. I mean, not that he can admit that. So it's kind of, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit. I thought our books would overlap well, well, would work together well, because they have all of these overlaps of talking about powerful women and, um, you know, kind of different takes on toxic masculinity. Um, so I guess. Also a hero with a secret, emotional secret that if he would yes. just tell the heroine, she would <laughs> fix it for him, but he can't. <laughs> Yes. And um, I love, you know, the emotional secret and the misunderstanding. And I really, I feel like lately in my writing, I try to lean into the misunderstanding in different ways. Because like, you know, a lot of times people say the misunderstanding could be resolved easily. But in reality, no. <laughs> there's, there's no, so even with things. your best friend, sometimes it's hard to like... Yeah. Have yeah, you can be like, you can be like you, you can not have the conversation or you can have the conversation but like have it in this weird way that makes things worse because people you know are bad at communication generally um, we have actually, actually we've done that like in our in our books in like the beyond series we absolutely did that in the build-up leading to like the relationship um development with uh, Ace and Rachel in particular, but we also had that in like a meta fashion, we figured out eventually, because like there were things that we wrote into the books leading up to, you know, their book with Cruz that uh, we had different viewpoints of, <laughs> you know, we, we yeah. figured out eventually yeah, that, that like we- The understanding was ours, not theirs. <laughs> yeah, well, it was also theirs. I mean, it yes, worked but... as theirs. <laughs> But, you know, it, yeah, it was a completely meta thing because there there were events that we both had, like, this completely different point of view on. And, I mean, we're only, you know, creatively invested 
in these events, right? We're only creatively invested in these characters. We're not living their lives. And so imagine like that level of like being in it. I mean, like how, how oblivious can we be sometimes when we're in situations, you know, when, when we're actually the ones going through the stuff and we're just like, Oh, okay, no, I don't know what's going on, you know, but I'm going to be very angry and upset about this. You know, I mean, like they're people, these characters are people. And we're not talking about some kind of like, you know, ridiculous overheard conversation, like a three company type misunderstanding, you know, I mean, like, that's not what these people are having. They're having <laughs> actual conflicts. Yes. You're old enough to remember that show, aren't you? I love that show. I was obsessed yeah. with that show. <laughs> Um, I said something the other day about John Ritter, and I realized that my children only know him from Scrubs. It would be interesting to watch. I mean, I don't know how Three's Company would hold up, but it was. Yeah, I imagine not well, because it was very questionable yeah. back in the day. Yeah. Like, woof. I mean, oh, my God. I'm Larry sure. Larry and the Regal Beagle? No way. No, thank you. Uh-uh. Not going to go back, but my six-year-old self was all about this company. Heck yeah. You know, and they would have these situations all the time for you youngins out there and also people who, like, didn't, you know, spend their time watching Three's Company. Um, there would absolutely, like, almost every show, it seemed like, there would be some sort of situation where Jack, uh, John Ritter's character, would overhear some snatch of, like, a conversation, and it, it was always, like, a very leading sort of, you know, um, little bit of conversation that he heard, but he always took it to these, like, wild places and just completely misconstrued what was happening, and so basically, like, the whole events of that episode would, like, sort of spin out from that until finally they realized that, you know, it was all a big misunderstanding, but, like, that's not what we're doing like with these books it's you know it's a very emotional situation and these people have you know fears and they have traumas and they have um events that have happened to them in their lives that have shaped yeah. how they see the world and other people and especially how those people will accept them if if they really you know show them what's going on with them and then that's one of the big things that you know Knox has going on is that he has to hide his um not even just his motivations from Nina but he has to hide like who he is both like the good and bad stuff so it's very you can get into like so many layers with a misunderstanding yeah. it's not it's not as simple as, oh, a conversation will clear this up. Also, they don't that. know they're in a romance and they're guaranteed a happy ending. <laughs> yeah, like, who no idea? They, they don't know that this conversation that feels terrifying will go well, because how often do care conversations that feel terrifying not right. go well? Yeah. yeah. That's not... Um, if only we could tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be like the most boring. I mean, I guess it wouldn't be boring if you could actually like hop into your story. That would be amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for the reader, it would be like, what? Okay. <laughs> Which one of your worlds would you want to hop into that's not the Civil War or when no one's watching? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I might, I might hop into the Civil War to do some like, things that probably aren't advised by time travelers but um <laughs> i think that would be so scary though it oh my would, god it's so it terrifying. Would. but i would have like modern modern weapons but that's a oh, whole okay all right i didn't know bring, you were gonna like bring penicillin. load up <laughs> bring all the penicillin bring but penicillin assassinate of, jefferson davis know. and then set up as a doctor I mean, I wrote like a whole, you know, book about, but um, I won't get into, you know, time travel assassins and how that could fuck up the timeline. Um, but I think Reluctant Royals, I guess. 
because in other timelines there's always in other books there's always like scary reluctant royals is the most comfortable timeline <laughs> where i would definitely yeah. have electricity modern medicine um awesome friends <laughs> yeah but ai who love me I was going to say it's like dystopian, but it's not that far from our current future. So it also would be semi-comfortable depending on where you live. Where comfortable if, equals, yes. I'm already a nerd to the discomfort of. Right. I'm <laughs> already used to this shit. I'm already used to being <laughs> prevailed. It's cool. Oh, uh, God. NSA Brad is like, yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> Someday someone named Brad at the NSA is just going to pop up and be like, I've been hearing. <laughs> he's he's going to get called into his superior's office and be like, what is this? We keep getting oh. <laughs> oh, dear. NSA Brad, sorry. But um, one thing I did want to talk about was kind of, I don't know, not like compare and contrast, but I like thinking about uh, Shanti and uh Nina's approach to getting shit done and how both of them have this approach that's rooted in hope but they go about it a bit differently so can you talk a bit about um Nina's worldview I guess and how that fits in with the world she's in, in um Nina's worldview is actually um something that is um sort of like revealed over the course of the book, not only through her actions, but also through um, like Knox's perceptions of her. Um, at the beginning of the book, he very much considers her a very naive person. Um, she's so determined to do the right thing, even when it costs her, that he doesn't really understand that. Like he can't really wrap his brain around it. He, um, he thinks that she must not realize how much doing the right thing and helping others uh, is, is potentially going to cost her sometimes. He thinks um, she hasn't been hurt yet. Yeah. And so he discovers, you know, over the course of the book that she very much has been hurt a lot and that, you know, it, it doesn't always work out when she tries to do the right thing, but that she, you know, has made a conscious decision that she's not going to let that break her. Like, she's not going to let the fact that there are bad people and assholes in the world change how she treats people who are blameless in that situation, you know. Um, she will, you know, protect her people and protect um, people who need protecting, but you know she's she's always going to give everyone a chance, and that that is her her hope um, that she refuses to assume the worst. So, and that's hard. I mean, like we have like a, a near future dystopian situation here where you could assume oh my god that would be like really rough but it's hard for us today people now in our situation um that's really difficult and it's not only difficult because we're beset on all sides by people who who don't have good intentions or who are not acting in good faith, but also um, let's be real. We get made fun of for being, you know, hopeful and for not wanting to always, you know, expect the worst and for, I don't know, not, not approaching everything in life with the most pessimistic outlook um you know we get made fun of we get laughed at we get denigrated and then you know if things go wrong and we do get hurt we get blamed you know like what did you expect was going to happen it's like well you know uh, it's not our fault that somebody didn't act right like yeah. you know why would you turn that around like 
that's not it's never your fault when someone else treats you badly like that's that's on them we need to stop not putting it on them you know I mean there's nothing wrong with hope and expecting the best from people um I think that's like an yeah I think that's kind of I feel like Shanti is uh coming at it from like a more analytical or more um I was talk when I was talking about it a bit earlier I said practical but not practical is not the word because I didn't want to imply that other forms of hope are impractical but where she sees it as a problem that can be solved using all of the things that people say um are kind of not congruous with being hopeful like logic um you know going so she's gone to school she's done she's received all of these accolades and people are like well why wouldn't you go be a ceo somewhere or some like making tons of money and she's like well i'm going to be a queen which everyone sees as a ridiculous goal um and then she achieves it i mean it doesn't work out (laughs) quite how she imagines it's going to work out but it's kind of this idea of having being so determined to do something that at a certain point people depending on like for example Elon Musk is like yeah I want to like go to the moon just to hang out or whatever he wants to do and like mine for moon rocks or destroy the moon or you know whatever and he's like seen as some kind of genius but like um which he's not okay I'm not gonna okay I'm not gonna go there I'm not gonna go there (laughs) Uh, he's not turning this to uh, an anti-elon musk street but but, uh you know i mean it is what it is come on (laughs) but generally with like particularly if it's a woman or someone from a marginalized group who has a very specific goal it it becomes easier and easier to treat a specified goal as silly um the further you get away from an elon musk type person it's so, arrogant so, and entitled like why yeah. does you know just it, it and, is belittling them for thinking they exactly. deserve something even if they're willing to earn it and fight for it so much harder than anyone else would have to meanwhile exactly. tony stark people just assume he can get it done <laughs> exactly yes uh, so Moving like, it into a <laughs> fictional yeah. corner. Well, yeah. when we were thinking <laughs> about this, when, when you were talking about how Nina like refuses to not give people a chance, that's not what Shanti is doing. But it made me think of the mm-hmm. stubbornness, like in the book, of how like she goes to those council meetings, even though nobody's going to give her a chance to talk, nobody's going to listen to her. She doesn't even get to sit like where someone of her stature should but she doesn't stop there's a stubbornness to hope yeah. in like both of these and I, and I think in honestly like all of what all we write we mm-hmm. write these characters who stubbornly stubbornly hope and they do it in different ways and they have different strengths and different powers yeah. and different tools with which to you know chip and away think- at the things but yeah. And I think that's an important point, too, because sometimes it can, especially when you're writing strong, you know, strong women, um, that becomes a very particular thing. And one thing I love about Nina is, like, she has this particular kind of hope that is seen as soft in, you know, general, you know, the way people consider having emotions or being emotion soft. But she can fucking kill you. And yeah. she will with that. <laughs> and that she, is honestly a theme in our in this yeah. world that like <laughs> involves the mercenary librarians and beyond. Anyone who has the luxury of appearing soft to the public is the scariest person in the room. Because yeah. they yeah. have they don't have to scare you off. They can let you try them. <laughs> Nina kills four dudes on in like the first few pages of the book. She doesn't want to. She tries not to but they don't give her a choice. And when they don't give her a choice, she doesn't back down. You know, she doesn't feel great about it. 
um, aside from the fact that these were obviously people who were going to like go on and, and hurt other folks who maybe didn't have the opportunity to like, you know, defend themselves, but she's not necessarily going out to find people who are doing this, you know, she, she's busy in other ways, you know, um, if, if there's, if someone comes to her and says, Hey, this person is a problem, you know, she handles it, but she's mostly like focused on organizing the community in ways that will, you know, uh, basically bolster survival and not only like, you know, enable these people to survive, which they're not all doing, you know, they don't all have the resources to do, but also to, to thrive and hopefully have a little bit of, you know, independence from the tech corps and their, you know, methods of control. Um, one of the uh, characters that we introduced in the second book, The Devil You Know, um, is a seed smuggler. And he is like the coolest person because, you know, a, a lot of people don't really think about things like this, but the seeds that you buy, if you want to like plant a garden in the spring or they're infertile, meaning they can't self-propagate the fruits that you fruits or vegetables that you grow from these seeds. If you were to harvest seeds from those and plant them the next year, they're not going to grow because companies don't find that profitable. They want you to have to come back to them. And so, yes, the seed smuggler, the seed smuggler actually like, you know, um, has created a network of people who are, you know, growing heirloom varieties of, of these things and, and basically moving and selling uh, self-propagating seeds. Well, that's something, if you're going to be growing your own food, you need that, you know, you, unless you want to like go to the tech corps every year and buy their seeds, which, you know, I mean, I'm not going to go all conspiracy theory on people or anything, but you know, um, the tech corps, in our books, they definitely have modified their seeds. So not only are they infertile, but they have lower yields. Mm -hmm. um, and the fruits and vegetables that you grow from them are not the best quality. And they've done it on purpose because they want people to be dependent on not only being able to like buy these seeds and grow the stuff and feed themselves, but also have to, you know, uh, buy more food from them uh, at greater markup. And so there are multiple layers of, of dependency. And that's really the core of what Nina and her friends are trying to bust through. Like that's the first level. Like if you can make people less dependent on people who are trying to hurt them, then and, and use them then that's really the core of it all isn't it like if if they don't have to submit themselves to this treatment they become dangerous this you know actually, that's the root of community organizing that's actually i was gonna say that's actually like a great segue into kind of what is happening and how to catch a queen where yeah. It, yeah. it was like very difficult to balance while writing because Shanti wants to be a queen. She wants to be this kind of emblem of governmental power in a way. But she also at her is, you know, she also is a commoner. She comes from a farming family. She comes from a kingdom that is basically the best kingdom in the world in this universe. Uh, well, one of them, well, I won't get into all the other stuff, but um, maybe top two kingdoms, there are two, <laughs> two best kingdoms. Uh, but, you know, so she has this idea of how government can work and she's been spending her whole life thinking about ways in which government can work and how if she had, what she would do if she was ever given this possible, you know, this chance to actually achieve her dream. And part of that is not, you know, just being like, I am queen now, I rule all, and I'm going to make all these decisions. It's having a kingdom where people are free to interact with the, uh, have their voices heard, 
um, and like, you know, have their needs and wants recognized. Um, and part of her, what she's trying to contribute, maybe not always in a way that is conducive to being royalty is uh, that, that a kingdom is made of people and you, if the kingdom she's become queen of has kind of forgotten that um, because they're stuck in their thing. But yeah, so giving, they're stuck in their ways for reasons, but um, giving people, you know, the power to speak out about what happens in the place where they live and that they make, um, I think is something that is an overlap in both of those books and I guess how we see the world, which is, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. having a government that tells you what to do and or any kind of organization or any kind of relationship because like, that's one thing I've been talking about that in a way, even though it's this hierarchical thing in this current form, it's a relationship. Um, and the way you get treated is the same that you should expect in any relationship. Obviously it's not a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a human being, but it's, uh, you know, it, it has probably the biggest relationship with one of the biggest effects on your life. <laughs> so how much say you have in what happened or how much, not even say, how much you are able to affect what happens. Um, obviously you would want more of a voice or more of a uh, possibility of having your voice heard at least. So I think yeah. that is something that overlaps with those uh, thinking about the quote that she wrote in her journal from her favorite queen about uh, the the leopards is it the leopards oh it's the lions aardvarks oh okay so if there is a council of lions um they're gonna think that eating aardvarks and and they they would vote that eating aardvarks and okay this is a paraphrase but if there was, if there was a, a council of lions, they would vote that eating aardvarks and antelopes is great. Uh, if there is a council of lions, aardvarks and antelopes, they're going to come to a different conclusion. Um, yeah. Who has a guess, voice in the room and whose needs and, you know, yeah. whose problems are being even considered? Because it's not, and like, I don't think... The, the biggest divergence in our book, I think, is between active conscious evil. The tech yeah. corps represent mm -hmm. a pretty yeah. aggressively self-conscious of what they are. They're not they're not under any illusions that they're doing the right thing for anyone. They just don't care. They're doing what Some they're doing. Some people involved in it might be, but yeah. I would say on the whole, you know, they recognize that they are, you know, holding people down and using people for their own, you know, power and, they and may comfort. think it's for the best because these people can't do anything for themselves, you know, but I think that Where there's- Where have I heard that before? <laughs> I think there's a much less malevolent situation with your, oh, yeah. in your book. Oh, definitely. Um, it is more of a trapped by toxic masculinity situation, which I think if you go back to how we were talking about Nina being able to be publicly soft because she has nothing to prove is like the exact opposite of your hero who has this mm -hmm. so much fear inside of him. And so he has to be harder and harder and harder so nobody will see it. Yeah. And you know, that's a, it makes me so sad like I cried at the end of your book I cried like really hard it was extremely cathartic we don't live in a society that would allow you know yeah so I cried when I was uh editing it like every time I edited it I cried which is the first time I think that's happened <laughs> while writing a book I mean I've cried but like usually it's like okay the next time I read it that's fine but you know, Sonia, he was, yeah. a, it was nice to see him. I mean, I know I made him, but it was nice. <laughs> it was nice to see him uh, have, have his catharsis. It's so yeah, it's nice even when you've made them. He, he could be vulnerable with somebody. Yeah, and you like, know, I was actually thinking, well, when you were talking about the vulnerability of Nina and Knox, 
and you know characters with each other like you know something that I feel like influences on some level how I write my characters is um I was listening to some podcasts with some dude who's made uh, a researcher about like love and relationships his name his name will come to me later but he said something about how a lot of misunderstandings and relationships are because and oh yeah I don't know if this is I just thought it would be it was interesting from a romance point of view particularly that um when we're kids I mean obviously this is not universal but our parents know what we need and they give it to us. We cry, they give us food or whatever. Um, and then we live in a society that doesn't really tell us how relationships work. And then we get married and we assume that because we are part of this unit now that the other, or you know, in a relationship, it doesn't have to be a marriage, that the other person will automatically assume, I mean, um, automatically understand what you need <laughs> from just from like your behaviors and so that's what I often think about in the misunderstandings and stuff like that is that there is a you know and kind of society has this thing uh where oh if this person loved you they would understand exactly what you need when in reality um yeah like how <laughs> that's not how, how? it works romantic relationships, friendships, anything you have to, I mean, people understand you better usually, mm -hmm. um, but also there are gonna be points when you don't understand each other because everyone functions differently and it makes it easier sometimes and harder sometimes to talk about it because of this kind of betrayal of like, well, you are supposed to know me. So like with Sun, you, I think about that a lot with, um, how this would apply to whatever couple I'm writing and whether it would even apply to them. And then with Sanyu, it's the thing too of like, he didn't have that because he felt like his, uh, you know, he felt like his parents, uh, he didn't know his mom and they were like the rotating queens. And then his parents kind of didn't know him. They were trying to make him into something else. So he doesn't even have that baseline concept of like what a relationship is. Uh, and so, you know, kind of taking him from not even having like a real conception apart from like storybooks, which he was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> this is not how it works, I've seen it. And then having him kind of go on the journey of like trying to understand um, how relationship works was you know just interesting to me I'm always interested in that and uh it was not fun for him I don't think but it worked out in the end <laughs> I think the really um from that like perspective we don't really deal with that um in in deal with the devil um or really yeah. with any of the mercenary librarian stuff, because I think they don't really bring that, that presupposition, you know, that, oh, my lover is supposed to, you know, know me. I mean, like in Knox's case in particular, like, I think that the biggest reaction that he has is that he's just sort of like shocked that anyone would want yeah. to care yeah. about him, you know, that it's like that anyone would, would want to put forth that effort. Um, and then, of course, you know, like, I think that he really kind of has a, a, a little bit of a progression through the book where, like, at first, I think that he sort of makes this assumption that Nina cares about him because she cares about everyone. Yeah. Um, which is not false, but also, like, I don't think that he really realizes at first that it's, you know, a different situation, that it's special that it's you know uh her caring about him in particular um and for nina i think that she's i think that she's just so accustomed to liking people so much that she wants to learn about them like she's genuinely interested in people and so she doesn't really run into a situation where she doesn't know um doesn't know people enough to know 
what they need. Like she's very tuned into it, but that's just because that's, you know, she learned that it doesn't come necessarily naturally to her. She learned it from her sister. Um, and I think that carrying that with her was a way for her to, to keep her sister's memory, Zoe's memory sort of alive and living through her. Um, there's a lot, there's just, there's just a lot about Nina that's like, it seems very, and I think you're right. I think that we just kind of assume that people who are that way are just naturally that way and that they haven't decided I'm going to be invested in other people. I'm going to actively listen to them. I am going to, to make a decision that this is a part of myself that I will, you know, invest in them. But um, we can do that. Like any of us can do that. It's not. And I, I think there is a little bit of a roadblock there that, you know, sometimes we really just do need to understand that this is not an automatic process. Yeah. Sometimes it takes work. Sometimes we need to sit there and say to ourselves, okay, I'm going to make an effort. I'm going to make an effort to not ask people what they want for Christmas. Instead, I'm going to like, you know, uh, think about them and their hobbies and, you know, what they like and what they don't. And, you know, I'm not going to buy them what I, you know, think is a good idea for an idea. I'm going to really consider what they want or need in their lives. You know, I mean, and it does take work. It's effort. And fact, I think I would say the instinctual version of that is almost always something that slides easily into toxicity. You kind of have to be doing this with your head um, because like, I think all three of us, I mean, I think the whole romancing the runoff thing was in sometimes <laughs> uh, Tessa Dare came in and texted me at one point. She's like, you guys, I think you're in a little martyr bubble in there <laughs> because we were all just, you know, sliding a little recklessly into what more can I give what more can I do what more and you know mm-hmm. there's a point where that's not a productive way to engage with people or the world yeah. or activities you know uh, can I just say that this is literally what how to find a princess is about <laughs> I'm so excited I've been so excited anyway yeah. but you know I mean not to like it's not to an extreme level but uh one of the heroines is dealing with uh, grappling with that knowledge. Um, yeah, I'm wondering which one now. I'm trying to think. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't. You, no, you did. It's I. Oh, we'll talk. We'll talk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> a question. Oh, oh, there's a question. Okay. If you were giving someone your book or books as a gift, what would you choose to accompany the books? Hmm. Deal with the devil, a peach pie, and a fork. <laughs> no, I would say a freeze dryer. Oh, well, if we could get the baby. Someone thing. give me that. And then yeah, the- I want one. But <laughs> vehicle morning. Um let's see, a a companion gift um for print on paper, I guess it would be a teddy bear. Um for depends on the age too. I mean the teddy bear for adults. It's fine, as we learn in the yeah. Book. Um, I want a teddy bear. I have fine. Good. Um, when my husband and I were dating, that's actually one of the things that we would do all the time. Is that like just you know every couple months or just for no reason or whatever, we would be you know out on a date, and if we were anywhere near the mall, like <laughs> he would take me to build a bear. <laughs> And I would make a teddy bear or a stuffed animal or whatever. And I still have, I still have some of them. Um, Yeah. So (laughs) I have, I have, my favorite one is actually a pig in overalls. And his name is Mr. Snouts. He's the country ham. Um, (laughs) So, yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> so yes, they're fine for adults. I mean, you know, I also gave him stuffed animals and stuff. So whatever, dude, it's fine. We were like, you know, in our late twenties, early thirties. It's fine. Come on. Bears are always fine. Oh, I yeah. did have another good gift idea. Um, the AI who loved me with uh, a Google Home or an Alexa. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Only if it's voiced by Mindy <laughs> Kaling. Right, right. <laughs> it would have to be a very, very special Google Home or Nest or Alexa or whatever. It would have to be very special. <laughs> um. Are there, I don't know how to see any questions. If there are I think that's the only one. Um, Does anyone else have questions? I have so. to think if I have any questions. Tell me, tell me two things about how to find a princess. Two cool things. Two cool things is um, one of the heroines is from Atlantic City, New Jersey. And it was because I realized I, you know, I'm from New York, but also New Jersey. I spent half of my life in New Jersey and half in New York, but I felt like I was not representing New Jersey in my heroines. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm not from Atlantic City, I'm from Jersey City which is a very different environment, but I wanted, I decided to make uh, a Jersey heroine. Um, and so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, um, I guess the fun fact about the cover, which was shot, you know, while everything was on lockdown. And um, I thought we were gonna have to like, you know, do stock photos or, an illustrated cover and then it became this thing the woman who makes the dress well the woman and her mom who make the dresses so I put some of it in the newsletter but then it was like actually more than that so Nadine who is the art director um, first she had to track down the woman who's been making the dresses for the covers uh, since the prints on paper and she had retired from dressmaking actually <laughs> <laughs> and Nadine tracked her down, pulled her in for like one last heist, hopefully not one <laughs> last heist, there's still one more book in the series, but uh, pulled her in for another thing. I believe she is like screenwriting now or something. Uh, so she decided, she was like, yes, yeah, so I'll make this dress. Um, so she's making the dress, they're looking for models. They're, it's very difficult to find models for a romance cover. Um, and then her sister is a model and her sister's friend is a model. Uh, and basically it became a family affair for the cover with the dressmaker being the mom and the sister, the dress wearer heroine being another sister and the other heroine being her friend. And that is, that is how the cover came together. So imagine and, finding the, t it's so hard I to mean, find the perfect Andy models for a cover and they were quarantining together. Like <laughs> that's some. I mean, yeah. like, when they sent me the pictures, I was like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> they look amazing. I like, you know, it was just really um, any, you know, thankfully came together for an amazing cover. Uh, am I going to write? Um, are you going to write any more historical fiction? Oh, Shelly yeah. F. wants to know. I love the Royals series, but I like the historical stuff, and I'm tired of Regency Dukes. I am. I have a couple of ideas that hopefully will come to fruition in the next couple of years. I'm still working on the backlog, but I definitely have historical ideas that... I know um, at least one of them, and I want it so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't we wait. We are not that. spilling. No. Yeah, that's but going to be a, a big surprise, but I mean, I know it's my idea, but I'm like, man, I can't wait to write this so I can read it. Um, <laughs> so there, there are, yeah, two main ideas I have and other ones, but I will definitely continue to write historical fiction, just not every year. There's been like a little lag in that. I would love to write historical romance. 
I'm just going to say this at every single event that we do. <laughs> right? gonna Eventually, we're going to have to. We're just going to do it. Just, yeah. you know, find me like 18 more hours a day and then we're on it. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to do it. Okay. So I think I would do uh, the witches and werewolves on the Oregon Trail is what I would do. <laughs> so I don't want to do Regency Dukes either. I want to do... We're doing the closest thing to Regency Dukes anyway right now in the Gideon's Rider series. They're basically Regency Dukes. So yeah. post post-apocalyptic dukes. Yeah. Um, it's basically what they are. So yeah. That is fun. What are you all working on? What well, if there are no more questions, um, or while we wait for any final questions, what are you all working on now? We are finishing up The Devil You Know, which is book two in the Mercenary Librarian series, which is about Maya, who is my brilliant little baby with a super memory, um, <laughs> and Gray, who is a stone cold sniper with a squishy, squishy heart. <laughs> so do, do love it. We are... This is the slowest burn romance we ever have and probably ever yeah. will write. Oh, like, yeah. You can use my song then. Uh, like oh, we are yeah. way into this book and like they are still like almost kissing. It is it is crazy. Uh the other day while I was working, I started hearing the phrase it's a slow burn to um I, the company. So uh -huh. I think it was like it's a slow burn. It's a slow burn. <laughs> It's a slow burn. It's a slow burn. Yeah, I know. I was like, oh my God, Alyssa, why? Why would you put that in my head? Why? And so for the whole rest of the day, I was like, bum, 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 bum. it's a slow burn. I was <laughs> like, no, no, no. Sorry. It's and okay. I needed to get it out of my head. The other people. Now it's going to be in my head again, and I've given it all to you. <laughs> Yay! But Everybody can it's sing the slow fault. burn story. So it's I like, I don't always, I mean, we don't write slow burn. We're sort of infamous mm -hmm. for like, oh God, yeah. it's an orgy in chapter three. <laughs> um, not that, not that mercenary librarians or Gideon's writers either have been quite that, but like Ivan was the slowest burn we had written before. And like, this is, you know, but these are two were... characters and, you know, I'm writing someone with, like, <laughs> sensory issues right now. So, like, yeah. she's not mm -hmm. someone who touches people a lot. It's a big yeah. trust thing for her. So it's just, like, so slow and so wonderful. And he's that patient, wonderful hero. And I love him. <laughs> Donna's writing Gray, him, so I get to say that. Gray is also not, like, very... Like, he is definitely the closest thing to, like, demisexual hero that I've ever written he's not he's just unconcerned you know unless like there's actually a passage in um in the devil you know where um they're considering whether they might need to uh distract Nina by you know like uh laying out some manly charm or what have you and Gray's in like the first yeah, book, I not in the second one yeah. In the devil, you know. <laughs> it's not oh, did I? Yeah. No, I meant deal, deal with, with the devil. devil. Deal with the devil, yeah. And Gray's like, I mean, I guess I could, you know, give it a shot. You know what I mean? He's not, <laughs> not that he finds Nina distasteful or whatever, but like, you know, to him, his his sexuality is something he doesn't really think about unless he has to use it as a tool. And, you know, that, of course changes yeah. with Maya but really only with Maya so I mean it, he's not he doesn't walk around all the time thinking about like you know what he's gonna do uh, who he's gonna do that day he's not he's not Rafe or Danny <laughs> for that matter Especially <laughs> so, Danny. You know, yeah Danny enjoys getting it on with folks you know, I mean, ain't no shame. She she just does what she wants to do. And there's no shame in Gray doing that either, doing what he no. wants to do, which is nobody except Maya. <laughs> and that's fine, too. So, you know, 
it's just a different, it ends up being a different process, you know, when you're like writing a romance and it's between someone who is basically like, you know, demisexual and someone who has uh, touch issues, they, they wind up, you know, taking, taking a little time. longer. That's yeah. I, I love a good slow burn. So I know a lot of people do. I forget there was a, it was like slow burn versus crock pot or something like that for the, for the term in Romance Landia. Um, I don't remember what the final situation, or if there was a difference between them. But, I think um, book three is going to be an instant pot. <laughs> Contents have been under pressure since book one. Pressure cooker. Yay! Yeah, we put, we put Rafe and Danny in the pressure cooker in book one, and so... It's probably just going to explode. <laughs> so, yay! That's exciting. So, I'm looking yeah. forward to that. Oh my gosh, it's been an hour. We've right. just been. Are there any more questions? I'm asking like I can see them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I snuck over to the YouTube. <laughs> I don't see any more questions. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to Love Sweet Arrow for having us. And yes. let's order your books from Love Sweet Arrow. And um, I guess we'll see you all on Twitter. I'll see you guys on tonight. Instagram. Come tonight. Um, oh, yeah. I'll see you yeah. If you go to the Romancing the Runoff, Romancing Runoff Twitter, we have links to where you can watch the stream tonight. There are like lots of cool people, you know, NK Jemison yes. and like champion figure That's skaters and Dragon Age writers and yes. gamers and just a nice combination of all kinds of different geekery. Yes, nerds. Fine. It's nerdery. People who love things intensely, which is what <laughs> all of us do. <laughs> and a good portion of them have never played Among Us yeah. before. So that's fun. Space, <laughs> murder, and anarchy for democracy. <laughs> Yay, thank you for having us, Alyssa. Yes, Congratulations you. on your book. Yes, so much. And for busting out the crowns and everything. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone.